With the affordability of high-quality cameras, there are a few things that limit the stories independent filmmakers can tell. But one of those things is set design. Even if you're handy with plywood and paint, you're unlikely to fit a facade of ancient Rome in your backyard. So you're left with two solutions, miniatures and CG. We'll cover miniature work in another video, but because of its accessibility, we're going to focus here on the CG solution. The kind of work we're talking about here is variously described as digital environment work, digital set extension, or digital matte painting. Whatever you call it, it involves creating the illusion of a much larger set through the use of CG elements created in a 3D animation software package. In our series on shooting visual effects, we incorporated the Eiffel Tower into our shot skyline. But set extensions can also be part of the foreground. In this video, we'll create the unlikely illusion of someone building a space-worthy rocket in their backyard. Now, the kind of software you end up using for visual effects work can vary drastically, so we'll focus here on the process. You'll need to look at the documentation of your applications to determine exactly which buttons to press and when. The good news is that what we're about to show you requires only a very basic understanding of 3D animation. A beginner level intro course will be sufficient. Of course, the more you understand about texturing models, the greater realism you'll get. If you're completely new to 3D animation, you may be asking, which software package should I learn? Unfortunately, that's not a simple question, but here's our best stab at an answer. First, try to avoid having to switch 3D animation software down the road in your career as a filmmaker. Switching 3D animation packages is something like learning to fly a plane and then learning to fly a helicopter. They both get you from A to B in the air, but they do it in such profoundly different ways Learning one is almost a hindrance to learning the other. So here, we'll break down a recommendation, at least based on the software available at time of writing. If you plan on working more in broadcast and think you'll want to create animated titles and motion graphics as well as visual effects, Cinema 4D is a good choice. It integrates tightly with After Effects and is very popular for motion graphics work, but still more than capable for feature film caliber CG. If you want to look at industrial design, game design, and architectural visualization, 3D Studio Max will probably be the tool of choice. And if you're entertaining a career in visual effects, Autodesk Maya is the industry standard. It's a bit of a bear to learn, but it's fairly ubiquitous in the industry. If you're an uber geek and love the idea of nodes, Houdini would be a perfect fit. And one more that kind of straddles all the fences is Modo a modeling package that's grown into a fully-fledged animation solution. We've actually chosen to use Modo in this video since it demonstrates the required steps in the simplest fashion of all the apps. What we haven't talked about yet is price. All the aforementioned software will set you back upwards of $1,000 for the production-ready version. Take heart, though. Many of the companies offer free licenses for student filmmakers. These licenses are either identical to the production licenses or limit output to a certain resolution. You shouldn't have any problem creating the renders you're after with the student version. Now, there are also some quite powerful free options out there. One of these is Blender, a highly capable open source animation package. While it's a feature rich application, we find it a little hard to recommend simply because it's something of a challenge to learn and has very little adoption in professional production circles. That said, it is free, and if you have the time to invest and have no aspirations of collaborating with other artists in a professional post-production environment, blend away. Okay, now that you've spent countless hours agonizing over which animation package to learn, let's get started. We'll begin by looking for a 3D model for our shot. Now, unless you have a very specific need, we recommend finding a model on the web rather than building your own. Web models range from free to a couple of hundred bucks. Even a professional modeler in an animation studio may take several days to create a single model. So unless you have nothing but time on your hands, buying a model will ultimately save you money. At the time we recorded this, the website 3dmdb.com offered a convenient meta search of some of the most popular 3D model sites. When searching for a suitable model, price does not necessarily dictate quality. 
Some artists will generously give away labors of love, while others will overvalue what they created to make a quick buck. So what should you look for in a 3D model? As an example, let's say we're looking for an electric guitar model. Here are some pointers. One, usually high polygon counts indicate a model more suited for film and video work. Polygon counts in the hundreds or low thousands typically mean that the model is intended for video game design rather than filmmaking. If the model listing includes wireframe snapshots, examine the detail. 2. Look for a model that was designed in the 3D animation software you're working with. This can sometimes be tricky to determine. Sellers will offer models in a variety of formats, but usually these are quick conversions from the original format and tend to have errors in the polygonal mesh or texturing that need to be addressed. That's a headache that newcomers to 3D animation do well to avoid. 3. Look for rounded edges. In real life, there's no such thing as a sharp edge. Put a knife blade under an electron microscope, and that puppy is going to look like the rolling hills of Ireland. One of the many things that makes CG renders look fake is perfect edges. They don't catch the light the way a slightly rounded edge does. For wider shots, you can get away with it. For close-ups, you'll notice it immediately. Rounded edges are also an indication that the model builder knew what she was doing. 4. Don't get too hung up on the photorealism of the sample renders. You'll most likely be replacing some of the textures anyway. Just make sure there's no stretching of textures around part of the model. This indicates bad UV mapping, which would present another time-consuming fix-it job. 5. The closer your object will be to camera, the more detail it needs. A guitar hanging on a wall in the far background need only have the general guitar shape. A model designed for video game will work fine. A guitar framed close to camera needs to have every screw articulated and every subtle imperfection in the fretboard showing to pass the inspection of a moviegoer's eye. With your model selected and downloaded, it's time to shoot our source footage. We won't cover that entire process again here, so be sure to review the video on shooting visual effects for details. We will, however, show you a different technique for capturing an HDR light probe of the scene. In shooting visual effects, we showed you how to use a mirrored sphere to create light probes with minimal expense. But with the advent of budget fisheye VR cameras, there are affordable ways to get quality light probes if you're willing to spend a little on a dedicated camera. We'll be using the Kodak Pix Pro here, but there are many comparable fisheye cameras, including those in the popular GoPro camera line. Start by placing the camera as close to the subject as possible. In this case, we want to illuminate the front of the rocket with more sky, so we'll avoid placing the probe camera in the backyard of the house, where the close proximity of the black wall would obscure most of the skylight. Instead, we'll move the camera to the other side of the fence. We then add a color reference chart and shoot multiple exposures of the scene. You see, we need some way of matching the black and white points of our CG and live action. And this color chart will give us what we need. We're using a gray tag Macbeth chart from x right here, but you can simply use black, white, and gray cards in a pinch. Next, we remove the color chart and repeat the identical exposures. That's because we want the color chart as a reference. We don't want it to potentially show up in scene reflections. With that complete, go ahead and perform your principal photography. If your shoot takes more than a few minutes, you may need to reshoot your light probe to account for changes in sun position. Remember that we need plenty of parallax between foreground and background elements to get a good 3D solve. Here, we don't have much in the foreground since we're shooting out of a car on the far side of the road, but there's enough parallax between the mid-ground bushes and the houses behind to get a good solve. As with the probe, we shot a color chart reference in the same lighting with the same camera settings as our principal photography. We also need to measure some features in the scene so that we have a good estimate of relative scale in our 3D animation software. Finally, don't forget to shoot a lens distortion grid with the current lens settings using the laser level technique outlined in the videos on shooting visual effects. Now, on this shoot, we had an overcast day. 
On a sunny day, you'll also need to account for the hard shadows of direct sunlight. Image-based lighting doesn't generate hard shadows, so these need to be created separately. To capture a hard shadow reference, photograph an upright object like a plank of wood for primary shadow reference. Measure the height of the wood from the ground and its width, and be sure to get a clear photograph of the shadow direction, size, and edge hardness. It would help to measure the shadow length as well. You can use this reference later to match shadow size, direction, and quality for your introduced CG elements. In Photoshop, we merge the multiple exposures first for the set of images with the color reference chart, and then for the set without. We use the same process outlined for the mirrored sphere probe in the shooting visual effects video. We want the color reference chart version to come along for the ride as a way to balance and align our colors during the composite, but what we really care about is the other image without the chart. That's what will ultimately illuminate our scene and provide scene reflections to any objects that need them. To combine the two captures into one Photoshop file, press Command A in one to select all, Command C to copy, then click over to the other and press Command V to paste. Now we have the color reference as one layer and the main light probe as a second. Let's rename the layers accordingly. There's one last step when working with a fisheye image like this one, and that's to convert it into an equirectangular image, the format most 3D applications expect. Before we do, we want to make sure the horizon line is nicely centered, so let's add some guides and measure how much off-center the horizon is. If we'd been able to place the fisheye camera on a perfectly flat floor, we could have skipped this step. Drag out guides from the side rulers for each horizon line. We can now use the rectangular marquee tool to measure the number of pixels from each edge to the horizon line. Here, the horizon is 240 pixels from the left and 390 pixels from the right. So we need to add 150 pixels to the left in order to center the image horizontally. Likewise, we have 240 pixels at the top, 348 pixels at the bottom, so we need to add 108 pixels to the top in order to center it vertically. We'll do that with a simple change to the canvas size with the resizing set to the appropriate corner. Now it's time to convert to an equirectangular image. Choose Filter, Distort, Polar Coordinates, choose Polar to Rectangular, and click OK. Apply the same filter settings to the color reference layer using the Reapply shortcut at the top of the filter menu. The wall behind which we'll be compositing our rocket is currently split around the edges of the image, so we'll just use the Filter, Other, Offset, and shift the image horizontally until the wall's nicely centered. Apply the same filter settings again to the reference layer. The standard equirectangular format is 2 to 1. Right now, we still have a square, so we'll choose Image, Image Size, and with Resample enabled, unconstrain the width and height, and set the width to twice the height. That gives us the 2 to 1 we're looking for. One last resize. In this rectangular format, 360 degrees of horizontal rotation are represented as we go left to right, and 360 degrees of vertical rotation are represented moving from top to bottom. In actuality, the Pix Pro we shot with only captures 214 degrees vertically, so our horizon line is too low. Let's create a guide exactly halfway down the image. Photoshop will snap to the halfway point for you. Select both layers and press Ctrl T on a PC or Command T on a Mac to use the free transform tool to line up the horizon with our guide. You'll notice that if we hide the hero layer, the reference layer with color chart isn't quite so neat on the horizon. That's because we were focused on resizing for the hero image, 
We only care about the reference layer's color, so close enough is close enough. Now we need to clean up the image to ensure our 3D is lit as closely as possible to the original lighting. The camera couldn't see directly below it, hence the empty space we were forced to add into the bottom of our image. And presumably the rocket will be resting on some grass in the backyard of the house, so let's fill it with some grass texture from another part of the image. There are many ways to do this, but we'll simply clone the grass over the empty space. Chances are, it won't be pretty. If we were adding a highly reflective sphere ball to our scene, we'd need to take more care, but we only need it to provide green bounce light to our shot in this case. You'll also want to take a patch of your new grass and apply it to the reference layer. If you're being meticulous, you'll want to use the offset filter again to make sure you didn't create any seam lines with your cloning efforts. If you did, just clone over the seam, then apply the opposite offset to restore it to the previous offset. All right, the ground is taken care of, but before we take this to the 3D app, we need to think through how our object is going to be lit by this image-based light. The rocket will be between the house and the block wall, so where our probe shows block wall, the rocket would actually be facing the house. We'll quickly clone extra house into the part of the image currently showing block wall to more closely mirror the light source from that side of the rocket. The rocket will itself cast a shadow on the back wall, reducing the light intensity, so we'll do a little color correction to account for that. That should do it. Again, it's ugly, but close enough for a lighting reference. We can fix the rest in the 3D animation software. Time to save out our image maps. Computers like images with dimensions to the power of 2 for efficient memory management, so let's quickly size this down to fit in a 4096 by 4096 size. Choose File, Save As, and choose OpenEXR as the format. Here, we'll save the main layer as rocketbackyard.exr, then we'll turn off the main layer and save the color reference card layer out as rocketbackyardref.exr. Finally, we'll save the PSD master as a backup. Now it's time to actually match move the shot. As covered in this shooting visual effects video, we'll use After Effects to perform a camera track, although you could track the shot in any number of 3D tracking applications. This footage was shot with a Blackmagic Ursa with a mechanical shutter, so there's no need for rolling shutter removal, but we have gone ahead and removed the lens distortion for the 3D solve. In After Effects, we'll enter the horizontal angle of view for our lens. We used the Create Camera trick to derive the angle of view from the focal length of the lens we shot with using the horizontal sensor value from the Blackmagic website. Watch the video on shooting visual effects for a refresher. We'll also set the After Effects tracker to detailed analysis for the most accurate results. Once the scene's been solved, we need to tell After Effects where the ground is. You do this by dragging a lasso around track points that you know belong to the ground. We'll set our ground level to the sidewalk since that's close enough to where the base of the rocket would actually be behind the fence. Right click and choose Set Ground Plane and Origin. You'll see that After Effects automatically adds a plane around the selected points. The origin is the center of a 3D scene where the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis all have a value of zero. It's often helpful to line it up with a specific location in your scene, but for this shot, what we care most about is identifying the ground, which we've done. But to correctly position the rocket, we'll need some helpful references. In particular, the walls of the house that will be directly behind the rocket will be helpful. As we did for the ground, drag a lasso through some points along the wall, making sure that the red target that appears matches the surface angle of the wall and choose Create Solid in Camera. 
After Effects creates a 3D solid layer and a virtual camera that matches the real-world Ursa we filmed the scene with. We'll repeat the process for the neighboring wall and the one next to it. The three created solids might match the orientation of the real-world walls, but they don't match the size. So we'll use the Scale, Rotate, and Position tools in After Effects to line them up better. We don't need to be 100% precise, just close enough to make these useful guides for lining up the 3D model of the Saturn rocket. To check our work, we'll switch to two viewers and create a custom 3D view in the new viewer. Using the unified camera tool, we can rotate the view and confirm that our solids match the right angle corners of our three walls pretty well. Not perfect, but this is art, not science after all. So we now have a scene in 3D that matches the real world scene. But how do we get this information to our 3D animation package? Unfortunately, the answer isn't so clear cut. If you're using Cinema 4D, you can use the Cineware Bridge to Cinema 4D that's built into After Effects. For other applications, you'll need to research the best way to get the scene across. Here, we're using the scripts supplied with Modo for translating between After Effects projects and Modo scenes. Next, we'll start building in 3D.